Yeah, there's no shortage of threats facing the United States, whether internally or externally, or you know, from our internally government, from our government, or externally from the uh, financial leaders of the world. Uh, as we see, the policies are changing, uh, the economic policies are changing. Um, what, have you seen the news on this uh, ending of the quantitative easing, Dave? Yeah, I have. But, but as long as the Federal Reserve is continuing to take $40 billion a month in mortgage-backed securities, it's just a backdoor to quantitative easing. It's there never, any time uh, a friend of the Fed needs money, they just crank up the printing presses. So I, I think it's a really uh, a facade in terms of a, a public gesture. Okay. All right. Well, let's shift gears and get into your specialty here, your research. Um, folks, off prior to the show, we had a conversation, Dave and I had a conversation, and uh, um, Dave said something, and it kind of struck me as as, as having a, a ring of truth and a ring of um, importance to it. And he said, you know, I'm just not sure people are understanding the importance of the information contained in the articles, the last, especially in the last couple of articles, the articles about Ebola. And I, and, and I was reading through the articles, and I'm thinking, there should be total outrage, total, uh, uh, not panic, but, but people should be kind of jumping up and down and saying, hey, what's going on here? So, Dave, Set the stage here. Tell us what, what's going on what your research has found. Well, I've been talking about Ebola for some time. Uh, it started with the immigration crisis because it was brought to my attention through uh, people uh, such as one of my confidential sources in, inside DEA. And what we know is that there are 100,000 West Africans, or were at the time that this immigration commenced, that were operating in Central America, and they were drug traffickers. And um, it just stands to reason, and Border Patrol people that I've talked to have confirmed some of this, that they're going to be crossing the border. Well, at the time, they were coming from the seven-state region in which there was an uncontainable live Ebola outbreak. And uh, Dr. Jane Orient, who's one of our top physicians here in Arizona where I reside, she had uh, and I had talked privately before she came on my show, and she said she was getting the same thing from her confidential sources. By the way, the Border Patrol is talking, but if they talk publicly, they go to prison. And so they're very, very discreet about who they seek out. I feel fortunate enough that I was sought out, and Dr. Orient has been sought out. We're getting the same information. The Border Patrol scared to death of Ebola crossing the border. And, and they, we should be for good reason. So I reported on that, and I just said we have an open border, and we have people from the region. We're certainly open to bioterrorism as a result of this. So you know, it's just an accident waiting to happen. Um, and I've kind of moved away from Ebola, except now and then it's been in the news, and I've read things that I know just aren't right. And I came across an AHA release by the CDC. And I have friends who listen to my show that are nurses and doctors. And a couple of days ago, I started getting uh, scanned copies on my email of CDC distributions on how to prepare for an Ebola outbreak. And to the best of my knowledge, I've heard from people in 11 states, so I have to believe they distributed this to all 50 states. The CDC, and I've got one of the scanned um, uh, representations of how to don an Ebola pre uh, prevention suit, a hazmat suit, and that's in yesterday's article at thecommonsenseshow.com, and I've got this scanned notice, and it, it just had come out 12 hours prior to me publishing the article, and I jumped on this, and I said, we got to get this out here because the CDC – who was conspicuously absent at the border during the uh, immigration outbreak and TB, re drug-resistant TB and scabies and all those things that have hit the Border Patrol agents, I said, well, here comes Ebola. And the CDC is clearly telling us to prepare for a pandemic. So I wrote the first article. It was fairly well-received, but not to the degree that I thought it would be. And I'm not putting my ego in this, guys. I'm talking about what are the greatest threats to public health, 
and people should pay attention to some of the things, and people should say, pay big attention to the Ebola things. So I, I was doing more research um, late last night, and I, I had an aha moment. And it's just one of those things that we've all experienced where we come across publicly available information that just knocks you on your backside. And, and this is what I found. And, and as a result, I wrote an article entitled The CDC – the NIH, which is the National Institute of Health, and Bill Gates own the patents on both Ebola as an illness and the related vaccines. And this is yeah, where... Folks, let that sink in. I, I, didn't, I don't mean to interrupt, Dave, but, but folks, let that sink in. I mean, think about that. They own the patents for the virus and the vaccine. The CDC, and I have the patent in today's article at thecommonsenseshow.com, and I just read the title, and the patent number is CA2241523A1. A is enable. And I have a copy of the impression of the patent, and it's owned by the CDC, and they own Ebola and any strain of Ebola that's within 70% of the original Ebola virus. So any mutated strain, you'll assume, will be within 70%. In fact, actually, it'll be within 95%. They own all Ebola as an illness. That's the CDC. This is why, in my estimation, the CDC is bringing in people from foreign countries who are Americans with the Ebola virus because they can claim intellectual property over the treatment. And they get to hone in on any treatment, and they can demand royalties from simply treating the illness. But it, it gets worse, my friends, because now we have an announcement, first of all, that Bill Gates is putting $50 million into Ebola vaccines. Well, that doesn't sound terribly disturbing, except you have to go to a website that I found last night at 1 o'clock Pacific in the morning. I didn't get to bed until 3. I had just one of those aha moments, got a rush of adrenaline, and I couldn't walk away. I came across a, wheel, a related website uh, to the NIH and the fact that they own the Ebola vaccines. And I want people to hear this clearly. On one hand, you've got the CDC that owns Ebola, the illness, and all related strains. On the other hand, you've got the National Institute of Health with Bill Gates as the primary investor who has put 560 million, not just the 50 million, I found evidence he's put 560 million dollars into this project. Now, the work is being done by a laboratory that's called Crucell, and that's spelled C R U C E L L. And if you put this in to Google search engine, you'll find it. This is publicly available. This isn't unnamed sources or leaked CIA documents. This is right there for the world to see. And, and let me read to you just a couple of the things that are on Crucell's website. It, first of all, it says, Crucell is developing an Ebola vaccine in collaboration with the Vaccine Research Center. By the way, they're controlled by NIH. And we're also connected to the National Institute uh, of Health, and that we're also connected to uh, Army Research Labs. They're all part of this. Hmm. Now, let me get down to the nitty-gritty here. That statement was made in 2004. Um, this gets scary. I, I, this stent ch chills up my spine. It takes a lot to knock me off my center of gravity because we see so much every day. But this was the one that really sent me for a loop. Crucell's Ebola vaccine, the ones tasked with developing it, entered phase one clinical trials in the third quarter of 2006. So everything that we're reading in the media right now about developing a vaccine, it's all smoke and mirrors. Folks, it's already been done. I've got the smoking gun right here. It says the clinical trials were commenced in the third quarter of 2006. Two groups of 16 volunteers we're talking human. We're not talking primates now. We're talking humans were enrolled and vaccinated. The study showed safety and what they call, excuse my stuttering here on the medical term, immunogenicity 
uh, the doses were evaluated and successfully administered. In other words, the people did not reject the medication. In October of 2008, Crucell secured a National Institute of Health Award to advance the development of Ebola and Marburg vaccines with the ultimate aim of developing a multivariant anti flavorious vaccine. Plain language, as I had someone explain it to me this morning, in the wee hours when I woke them up, they said any strain of Ebola is covered under this. That's the fancy language. So wow. they announced the fact that they were doing this, this Crucell laboratory, in 2004. In 2006, they do the clinical trials, and they say they met with some success, although they don't give you a lot of detail. In 2008, they got a huge monetary in, um, award from NIH to continue. And we know that Bill Gates has thrown in $50 million of seed money but there's also a group that's going to be administering these vaccines, and they're called the Global Fund. And the Global Fund is going to be like the vaccine center of the world. And, and guys, I can't believe that no one else has come across this, or if they have, my apologies. I haven't seen it. The Global Fund, which I hypertext linked to in the article, uh, it's a real existing entity and they're going to be in charge of HIV vaccines that Bill Gates and friends have given to, uh, tuberculosis vaccines, and the third one now is Ebola vaccines. And this is who Bill Gates gave the $560 million to. Now, let's use a little common sense here. Bill Gates is giving $560 million. He's going to expect a return on investment. He's a businessman. He's probably a trillionaire by this point in his life. Um, if you vaccinate everybody in the world, that $560 million is chump change. It's absolutely nothing. And so we look at the fact that now we have not just the genesis of who owns the vaccine, the genesis of who owns the illness. Now I've got named here the distribution company. Who's going to be distributing this? Now, with all these major players involved in this Ebola equation that's coalescing together in this dot connecting exercise, I would venture to say it's going to be mandatory. In fact, Doug, as I shared with you this afternoon, and I'm not going to provide personal, personally identifiable information, but I have two long-term friends high up in law enforcement. Greg Evenson five years ago on my show, and I consider Greg to be a very credible source. Greg Evenson, former Kansas State Patrol officer, highly decorated, came on my show and validated these facts after I made them public. During the height of the H1N1 scare, uh, there were several states, not just the ones I had contact in, that practiced DUI kind of roadblock stops, but it was for vaccines and they played with a scanner that would detect whether or not you've taken a vaccine. And if you had not taken the vaccine, they would, they would give you an opportunity to do so when you were being detained. If you did, then they just processed your paperwork and sent you on your way. If you refused, and let's say you had your family with you, the men would go on one bus and presumably go to a location, and they didn't practice it out that far, but this was the drill. The women would go yet on another bus, um, and then the children would go on a third bus. So they were going to segregate families by age and by gender. And they also had, as a mechanism here, a two-tiered system of intercept. They would have the regular roadblock, the tent, uh, the vans that had the equipment to do what they wanted done, but they also had another tier of chase cars. So as people see the traffic backing up and they go, oh, I've heard about this, I don't want to be a part of it, and people try to U-turn and make a run for it, the chase cars would run them down. And they drilled this effectively during the height of the H1N1 scare, and the country thought we were headed towards mandatory vaccinations as the National Guard and several healthcare workers around the country, mostly nurses, were forced to take the vaccine. Well, public outcry, I thought, pushed this back. I don't really believe that now. I think what pushed it back is this was only a beta test for what's coming. Back in May, when I first heard 
uh, or in June, I should say, when I first dealt with uh, the Ebola situation at our border and the potential for bioterrorism, I contacted my law enforcement sources, and I said, and I talked to them again this morning, and I said, tell me what's going on. And I talked to one of the two, I should say, this morning, to be accurate. And they both said pretty much the same thing. We get periodic updates from DHS telling us to keep these protocol training measures on file and ready to implement at a moment's notice should we have any kind of health care problem, such as a pandemic. And I'm paraphrasing what I was told, but effectively what they're saying is what you guys practiced four or five years ago needs to stay on the books, and you need to be prepared to enact this. And this is exactly what Greg Evenson confirmed on my show. Uh, these two people I have known Well, let's just say without – I'm afraid of identifying them. Uh, Let's just say I know them and their families intimately well. Uh, There's a 100% confidence call on this information. And I have another piece of information, too, that really starts to tie this together. This is a backdoor way into martial law. I had a conversation with my very, very best military source about this. And actually, we've had two conversations. And what he told me, is there is major grumblings in the ranks of the leadership of the military again, and he expects many more purges, because DHS, in times of a pandemic, have been, has been given uh, operational authority over the military. In other words, they'll direct the military where to go and what their operational procedures and guidelines will be. And obviously that doesn't set well with the military to be taking orders from a civilian organization, such as DHS. And it's also a backdoor into martial law. And what I mean by the backdoor into martial law is this. When soldiers are deployed to the streets and they're told to detain people and they know there's a health crisis, they're going to be thinking they're acting in the public interest. But it's actually a backdoor to martial law. The police will be involved. The police will be conscripted. And they'll be involved. And they'll all be thinking they're working to save the public health and save lives when in effect they're really operating as a martial law force. Travel's restricted, you're quarantining areas, you've got all the essential elements of martial law. This is how my source, my military source, the one who brought me the fact that there was almost a coup over Ambassador Stevens' assassination, he was the one who identified General Ham for me and, and Admiral Guyette, and I wrote that story, not to toot my horn, but I was months ahead of most other people on yes, that. Yes, you were. Yes, it's you were. the same I, I, source yeah. that brought me that information is bringing me this, Doug. And this is a backdoor into martial law, and Ebola is the key. Now, I've also been told we're going to have related terrorist attacks at the same time to make people run to the government for protection, and I think you've got good information on that side, much better than what I've got. Well, well Dave, uh, first of all, thank you for for that, uh, the the uh, scenario with respect to Ebola. It's much deeper. You, you know, yeah, I, I do have information about the other side of this. However, your side here, I think it's so important for people to really grasp the uh, enormity of this, it, w- folks. We're talking back in August. In fact, I just went to the website that you, that you referenced within your article, and, and folks, definitely go to thecommonsenseshow.com. Read Dave Hodges' uh, articles concerning Ebola. But uh, I went to uh, what is that, Crucell, and going back to August 9th of 2006, where the Gates Fund, or, or I'm sorry, the Gates Foundation. Where they where they promised uh, a half a billion dollars, five hundred million dollars. Uh, this is it's, it's breathtaking. Of course, as you point out, you know, with the in the larger sense, if you take a step back, it is chum change when you're talking about uh, the billions of people, uh, six billion people, or or just even people within the uh, United States uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, it's it, uh, I, I was astounded when you had laid this all out for me, and uh, I didn't. You know what? I did not make the connections that you made, and I just want to uh, just just commend you on on the connections that that you've made, uh, folks. It's imperative that you read and understand what what uh, Dave is saying. Go ahead, sir. Well, the the other thing that I wrote this week that I think uh, it, well, it definitely relates. Um, but it shows how dire this threat is. First of all, let me point out the obvious. You have American health care workers in foreign countries. 
Americans are the best in the world at hazmat procedures. Our emergency procedures medically in this country are second to none in the world. We're still number one. And you have people in these hazmat suits who are supposed to be protected from Ebola nine times Sunday coming down with the Ebola virus and being brought into the country. And, they're, and that means the Ebola is getting through these suits. Now, let me read to you something here very briefly, but I wrote this on September 13th on my website. It's still on the front page. In 2009, a Canadian research team from the National Center for Foreign Animal Disease and Canadian Food Inspection Agency, headed by Carissa Embry Hyatt, began conducting research entitled The Transmission of Ebola Virus from Pigs to Non-Human Primates. So in other words, we're talking pigs to monkeys. And what they found in this study, and this is public information, I link to it, and you go right to that Canadian government health website. So this isn't Dave Hodges interpreting information. This is the information that is there. And what they said is that um, these um, pigs that are involved in this, uh, let me go back and and look at this here again. Okay, pigs to non-human primates, meaning monkeys. The pigs are transmitting the Ebola virus through airborne means. This is what they concluded. This is 2009. This is five years ago. And yet we got the CDC perpetuating the myth that the only way you can get Ebola is through bodily fluid contact. Well, I submit to you that these American workers that are becoming infected couldn't possibly have bodily fluid contact with someone who's afflicted, so you've got to begin to look for other means of transmission, and I think I've just pointed out what this is, but it even gets more disturbing. This report goes further. This is why you can't contain the disease or the virus in Africa. It's uncontainable, and here's why. If you just had bodily fluid contact and you had an outbreak in an area, you simply quarantine the area and then you go piecemeal through the area geographically and isolate those that need to be isolated and then isolate everybody for 21 days. And if people aren't symptomatic, you let them go, but don't let them come back in the area. This is not a hard procedure to follow, but this is why that procedure will not work. And that's standard procedure, by the way, here in the United States as well with DHS and FEMA. The reason this won't work is because they found the Ebola virus in this same report lives inside the pigs. And what they don't know is if it lives inside other food stores as well. So they said, here you have people in the African bush eating a bush pig. In other words, a wild pig. They go out and they bow and arrow it, they throw spears through it, they shoot it, and then they barbecue the pig and have Ebola pig. And this is how some of them are contracting Ebola. This is what this 2009 report says. If it's in the food supply, gentlemen, you can't stop it because the, the, the pigs aren't going to obey quarantine boundaries and guards aren't going to be under orders to shoot to kill animals. You okay. can't contain this. This is, this is so serious. In fact, this article might be the most important of the ones I've written because it definitely shows – it doesn't show this. It doesn't show that humans can get Ebola through airborne means. But my question is, as as a trained researcher, why not? If you can have one mammal, a pig, give it to another mammal, a monkey, then why can't this jump to humans? You're already seeing cross-species contamination. Why can't it cross over into humans? And I think this is what the CDC already knows, and this is how these healthcare workers in Africa are being affected. Well, that certainly makes sense. And and tell me again, Dave, and I... Sorry if I sound uh, like I'm uh, I'm ignorant to this fact, but why are they bringing the uh, afflicted, the infected, back to the United States? Tell me what sense that makes, and uh, tell me again why, according to your research, the answer to that question. Well, I have to use common sense. Um, pardon the pun here in the research, but I do. Um, If the CDC owns Ebola, and that's clear, I've got the patents listed on my article, Um, if, if, if they own Ebola and you bring an American back inside the United States and the patent is good inside the United States, therefore you own the Ebola virus that's in the person. Ergo, any movement to treat the Ebola 
you have to compensate the holder of the disease. It's intellectual property. It's physical property. The Ebola virus is owned wholly by the CDC. So if you bring in, let's say, the XYZ serum to treat it, you would have to get permission from the CDC because they own the Ebola. So before you could do anything that could affect their property, they have to give permission. Cha-ching, do you hear the cash registers going off? Yeah, but wouldn't that, uh, conversely or alternatively, wouldn't that be the same with the exportation of the serum that would be used to treat the Ebola, let's say, in another country? Um, I, I'm just trying to follow this. Uh, I, I mean, I understand that part, but if we if we use if we took the same, and I'll use the word serum, I don't know what what, what else to use uh, to treat the Ebola in Africa. Wouldn't that have the same cash implications or, or not? Not unless the World Health Organization is on board, and that's the part that I'm working on piecing together. If you're issued a patent, that patent is only good inside the United States. That's, that's why they're bringing these people back in. They want okay. Ebola. They want to partner with anyone who's treating. You see, look at this as a joint venture. Okay, what you have are the procurement agents in the CDC. Let's bring Ebola to the country through any means possible. Okay, and they're going to partner. Their financial remuneration comes from the treatment. Well, who owns the treatment? Another government agency, uh, NIH. Yeah. They are partners. Now, who's funding this to a large extent? A man named Bill Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There's your triumvirate. But let's add in one other thing. Did you know the Army Research Labs are involved? I think I mentioned that. They're involved in the vaccine process. When you go uh, to Crucell's website, the ones who have been working on the vaccine, they mention the Army Infectious Disease Research Laboratories as being involved with them. And let's go back to a rumor that I'm sure you guys have heard. 1977, uh, the Army in their helicopters drop Ebola on villages in Zaire. Did you ever hear that argument? In fact, we yes. saw that portrayed in the movie Outbreak in the beginning scene. Yes, yes. And, and, and in my, um, or what I have here, it was 1976. However, I'll defer to you in, in the 77. You might be I mean, right. <laughs> I might have been off a year. But I, I, I'm looking at this now, guys, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm dead certain that I've just given you the players who stand to make all this money on Ebola. Now, um, Bill Gates is heavily tied in to the um, um, World Health Organization. I watched a speech last night at about 2.30 a.m. while I could still say conscious when Linda Gates was addressing the WHO in a meeting at the United Nations, and she didn't get specific as to illnesses and organisms, but she said, we can really work on this and partner and treat these illnesses and I think it was a pep talk to the WHO to get on board with what's going on. That's how I took it. Well, okay. Uh, would this be a deep population, um, uh, uh, deep population initiative as well? Well, I think so. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because uh, when you look at the – let's go back to the H1N1. Okay, I think this was the beta test. When you break down that vaccine that was hastily put together – they had an element in the vaccine designed to create more volume of vaccine. It's kind of like putting water in an alcoholic drink. You make the, the, a small drink filled with alcohol go to a larger size little fit of shot glass without, with water. Well, this is the purpose that something called adjuvants serves in a vaccine. You put adjuvants in a vaccine, it's a filler designed to create more volume. The problem is with that filler, the adjuvants, as we later learned, were filled with uh, MF-59 and squalene. And both of those properties serve to destroy the central nervous system. It destroys your immune system. What it does is over time, the, the vaccine eats away at your immune system and it makes you open to opportunistic viruses and diseases, not necessarily H1N1 or even Ebola, but anything because your immune system's compromised. I expect that this Ebola vaccine is, is going to be as deadly as the Ebola itself. It'll just be, let's say, longer acting. I mean, if you took 
if you took um, Ebola and, and you have the five day, um, or you have the five day to twenty one day incubation period, and then you take the vaccine, and if you had the same reaction, everybody'd start refusing to take the vaccine. But if the vaccine is more slow acting over time, let's say three, six months, two, four, five years out before it does its full damage, then you're going to get more public acceptance of taking the vaccine. So I don't think we're going to see you take the vaccine and you instantly drop. I do think what we're going to see is people take the vaccine and they're open for another more opportunistic viruses down the road. That's what I think is coming in this vaccine. And, Dave, uh, before the break here, I'm looking at an article from Foreign Policy, and this is from September 10th, and they're talking about a implementing a medical NATO uh, team through the World Health Organization declaring a state of emergency that would the medical NATO teams would be inserted into countries to provide Ebola drugs without consent of the governments. If you go back, back to the articles I wrote... In, 2000, in June of this year, one of the things that I speculated on, I said, I want to know why these U.N. vehicles are in the country. Do you guys remember that? And we yeah, were seeing yeah. U.N. vehicles being shipped all around the country. And at the same time, the Border Patrol was, were telling their confidential sources, and we were all talking about it, that Ebola is a risk. Uh, and I speculated in an article that I published where I said, I can foresee the U.N. coming in after an outbreak in which hospital emergency rooms are overwhelmed, you can't get in to see your doctor, the minute clinics are filled, people are sent home, the U.N. will come in, set up uh, these base camps of treatment facilities, and they'll appear to be the good guys in blue helmets. And then I said, I could foresee on the heels of this a backdoor into martial law. Well, now that we know that DHS is going to be calling the shots and enlisting the police and the military to infect uh, or to affect quarantine procedures and, and vaccination procedures. I think my instincts in June were probably pretty close to accurate. And so, Joe, back to what you said about that report in foreign policy, I think we're already seeing the manifestation of that right now. It's being put into play as we speak. Absolutely. And they go on to state that the World Health Organization would uh, issue a uh, a, health emer a global health emergency. They would follow the guidelines of the UN humanitarian goals, and these medical NATO teams would be inserted into the countries where the disease is prevalent without the authority of the governments, and they would be equipped with uh, weapons, uh, protective gear, and the ability to distribute the vaccine or treatment that they see, uh, and also be able to fight any external forces, as it states in this article. Um, uh, yeah, and see, that's a catch term, isn't it? What are external forces? Be, could could that be military it. units that aren't on board with the subjugation of this country? Uh, that's a wow. Okay. Mm. And uh, and I've predicted that. You know, if you look at the Milgram compliance study from the '60s, that measured how many people would put someone to death with minimal. Uh, authority over them. In other words, guns not to their head, just minimal authority. Milgram found two out of three people, and that research has been duplicated, so that number runs between 65 and about 75 percent. I think we can apply those numbers. In fact, I wrote an article um, this last week entitled uh, The Psychological Reasons Why U.S. Soldiers Will Fire on U.S. Citizens. And I quoted some of these numbers, these compliance studies, whether there's a Solomon Ash study or the Zimbardo fake prison study out of Stanford or the Milgram study, all have pretty much the same numbers in terms of compliance rates. But also inside the compliance rates are the non-compliance rates. So you could have anywhere between about 20% to about 35% of the military saying, we're not on board with this. And I think you'd see a, a greater number in the police where there's really less um, external force placed upon you to comply, as you would find in the military. So you're going to find a sizable contingency inside our military that once they figure out this is a big scam, they're going to stop complying. And this is what I think that phrase means to uh, fight against outside forces. I think I've just told you what the outside force is. I, I, and I think you're right on the money with that, Dave. I, I, I've got to tell you, looking at this, 
And, and folks, uh, I, you've got to go to the Common Sense Show dot com and and look at the uh, two articles, at least the two articles that are being referenced here in this conversation, to really get a full understanding. And by the way, follow the links as well, uh, the citations that uh, back up the claims that uh, uh, the assessments that uh, Mr. Hodges is making. And I think I think you'll find that none of this. You know, we've been accused, uh, Dave, of fear-mongering and saying, oh, this is, um, you, you know, uh, uh, accused of making something huge out of something that, that, that it's I know, not. I know, Doug. I, well, I actually started one of my articles out this week, and I said, I've been accused of fear-mongering on the Ebola virus. Well, I have a new partner. It's called the CDC. And I, re- <laughs> I referenced the fact that they sent out these protocols on how to treat Ebola. Why would they send that to every emergency room in the country, all these doctors and nurses, unless they knew something was coming? It, that makes no sense, unless they know the jig is up and Ebola is on its way or maybe even possibly here. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. People, can say, people can say what they want, but you raised a good point. Go to the articles and click on the hypertext links, but do it quickly because, Doug, I'm sure you and Joe have found this. We'll break a story, and within a week, uh, a week they've changed the link. And they Absolutely. made it go dead. Yes, yes. And, yeah. And, and, yeah, I experienced that quite a bit. And, and, of course, you know, you're very high profile, and, of course, we are as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, certainly download the information uh, both at the, from Mr. Hodges' website but also the, the, the citations of the, the links. Uh, one one final question. I know you're – and thank you for being generous, generous with your time, but – uh, why Bill and Melinda Gates? I know that sounds weird, academic. Uh, I, I think I, I can answer that, but let, let me. I want to say something really quick as an aside, sure, and sure. I'm going to answer that question. Um, if you really want to know the A to Z on the recent Ebola crisis, and I don't have all of it, but I have a good portion of it. If you go to my search engine at the top of my website and just write in Ebola. You can kind of read the history of how it's evolved, and you'll see my thought processes as I've uncovered information at each step, and people will see my thought process on how I arrived at the conclusions I have. Although people today, in today's article, these aren't conclusions. These are facts. You have a conspiracy. It's Hegelian dialectic designed to bring a bullet to the country, release it in some form. They have the cure, <clears throat> quote, unquote, and, and they own the vaccine that's going to make the money, and they're clearly going to make it mandatory. Now, back to your question about Bill Gates and why Bill Gates, I, I have to put my speculation hat on because I'm not privy to those kinds of meetings or inside information. But let's just look at how Bill Gates made his money. He, he made his money in computers. And what's really at the heart of the police state surveillance grid, if you took away all computers, you wouldn't have much of a police state surveillance grid. You'd have to do it the old East German Stasi way and hire people in the next door apartment to spy on their neighbors. But right now it's all electronic, it's all computers. Well, who started all this process? Who built the back doors into Microsoft and all the Microsoft related programs? Well, it's Bill Gates. So he became a player in a very major way in the uh, police state surveillance grid that permeates basically the Western democracies. And so why Bill Gates? Well, he's made more money than God, and he's had this fascination with vaccines since day one. In fact, in one article that I read last night and didn't include it because it wasn't relevant, he said he wants to um, vaccinate every child in the world for polio with a vaccine, every, every child. But that's a, that's a lucrative business. So he's, he is the major player in this. This is like, you know, Rockefeller and Rothschild, they run the banks. Uh, this guy, he runs the vaccine business. And, and that makes sense to me. Yeah, and I think if you look at it, it's just a compartmentalized aspect of this. Now, if we trace this far enough, we're probably going to find bank involvement. Who's bankrolling outside of Gates? Who's bankrolling some of these operations besides Bill Gates? <clears throat> I, I, I suspect, as I continue to dig in this, I'm going to find the old reliables like Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, the bad boys from, from Basel. That's where I think this is headed, because I don't mm. think Bill Gates is funding the entire operation. He's the front man for the operation. 
he's the one that gets the publicity when he does $50 million here. In fact, in the article, it's a PBS release that says he's donating $50 million to fight against Ebola. And then I found another one that says, well, it's actually $560 million to the foundation that's going to basically be disseminating the vaccine. So he's your major face of this operation, but he's certainly not the only player. And I do think Bill Gates probably answers to a higher authority. Uh, I think you're right. And wow. <clears throat> this so, you know, good. guys, we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, you know, yeah. I don't know if they're going to release Ebola segmentedly, you know, in this country in small pockets and call it a major pandemic when it's really not, or are they going to just let it sweep across the country like we saw in the movie Outbreak? I don't know what form it's going to take, but I can tell you that these men aren't putting this kind of money into these ventures unless they're expecting to get a return on investment. And so, therefore, how do you get the return on investment with Ebola? Well, you vaccinate people. It's going to be mandatory. There's going to be vaccine DUI kind of roadblocks. They're going to stop you, and they're going to detain you and send you to a camp if you refuse to take the vaccine. Yeah, Awkward and we silence could, because of the – I mean, th- just think about the implications there. And, and, you know, we see a headline today, dozens of children feared dead after being injected with tainted vaccine from the World Health Organization. As many as 36 children have died unexpectedly in Syria from a U.N.-sponsored program uh, in Syria. Um this is a small. I mean, we've seen the STDs that were released in the in the '60s in in vaccines. There are um, a lot of nefarious people, as you said, Dave, with motives, financial and control, you know, uh, motives um, that are behind working behind the scenes to implement this um, strategy to get the World Bank, the UN, the World Health Organization involved in. Uh, combining their authority for international operations beyond any scope of, of sovereignty of government. Um, let, let me give you another one. You know, I think one of the skills I picked up from coaching college basketball was a big part of your job is to scout your opponent, both uh, video scouting and in-person scouting. And you do so to try to not just know what their strategy is, but how they're going to react in certain situations. And so you're kind of ready for that. And I, I like to apply that thinking to this. I've been thinking, what, what if we were able, you know, the, the, the Hagman Report, and you've got the Common Sense Show, and we're able to wake a lot of people up, and it's, heck no, we're not taking vaccines, and we're in the streets protesting. You know what I would do if I were them? And, and I have a hard time saying this because I'm a nonviolent person, but knowing how they think and how, what low regard they have for human life, what if chemtrails turned into an Ebola drop? You just fly over a major metropolitan area uh, and start spraying out the chemtrails, and you mix an Ebola with it. Think how the other side it. thinks, guys. I mean, that's not how Dave Hodges and Doug and Joe Hagman approach life, but you can't tell me that the other side doesn't have that kind of depraved indifference towards humanity. No, oh, You're not. exactly right, Dave. I've yeah. even seen um, different papers and, and theories of – uh, how the chemtrails are, are one uh, part of the equation when introduced to another chemical, uh, a dormant uh, chemical that is inside our body from the chemtrails becomes active and the two chemicals combine to create some kind of pandemic. And as, as a, a working theory that somebody yeah, had well, going, like, but like it's not out of the realm of possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, like a reagent, but, but I think it, it certainly could be multi-purpose. Uh, Dave, I think you, you brought up a good point there. Uh, we, we've got to start thinking outside of the box when we're dealing with these potential scenarios. We cannot think like normal human beings. We've got to think like these, um, I- excuse me, but these bastards that we're dealing with, um, the enemy. The, 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 you know, I'm sorry to say this, but you're looking at a very nefarious, very uh, evil at its core, plan, evil people, evil agenda. Uh, man, oh man, oh man. Let me let me give you another one here, and this is probably even more realistic than chemtrails. Uh, about two years ago, I came across a DARPA release, and they actually have the video, and I've written about it on my website. And I have this video that shows a drone that can drop 100,000 little drones 
um, and they're called micro aerial vehicles. And they can, one drone can drop up to 100,000. They're the size of small birds or small insects, but they can intercommunicate with each other. They can apply lethal force. They can work on separate missions or holistically on one mission. And the DARPA video says up to 100,000 from one drone. And I want you just to imagine for a second, you wouldn't even have to risk uh, the bad guy's health on the other side from dropping this. You simply just fly a drone, let's say, over Sacramento, California, and you release these 100,000 micro aerial vehicles, and their mission is to release Ebola. You could infect the whole city, you know, within a matter of hours. Uh, that technology is here right now today. And people can look that up, micro aerial vehicles from drones. And you can actually put it in the Common Sense Show, and you'll probably come to the article where I have a video of it. Yeah, in fact, I've I've seen that, um, and you were the I, I think Dave, you were the first one to introduce me to that terminology, MAVs or micro uh, aerial vehicles. I, it's it's almost incomprehensible as, as you as you point out, but nonetheless, we've got to we've got to take a look and think this way and and think well, about Ebola the, too is is not is ninety percent lethal. Don't believe the 60% figures you're reading out of Africa. We have 30 years of documentation says it's 90%. So yeah. let, you're not do, the only what one do you do? That. Let's say you send in the micro area vehicles and you wipe out a good portion of a major city like Oklahoma City or Sacramento. They also now have these uh, these uh, drone robots, and, and and they're like bears. Uh, first of all, they're almost impervious to destruction. You'd have to have a 12-gauge 12, 12 right next to them just about to take them out. They can run 30 miles an hour, and I've got a video on that in the same article I wrote about DARPA technology. And I could see these guys being the cleanup forces. So, okay, again, I'm going to put on my coach's hat, and I'm going to think like the other side. I would do a micro-aerial vehicle attack if the folks were up in arms. They're not going to take the vaccines. Fine, we'll just depopulate the area. You send in the micro-aerial vehicles, you're going to have a 10 to 12 percent survival rate. So then you let loose the robots, and the robots come in as a cleansing force. And we know from the research that these robots uh, not only follow program directions, they no longer have to be controlled by a guy with a joystick at headquarters because the new artificial intelligence allows them to make up their own mission initiatives as the situations change. So they're the smart robots. They have facial recognition capability, and they have weapons capability. These could be the follow-ups that would come into a metropolitan area and basically cleanse the city of any survivors. And, and people say, that's right out of science fiction. Yeah, it is. And where do you think science fiction gets some of these ideas?